Hello, my name's Tim Shoebridge. Well, here it is, the Moog One. I've had this synth now for almost six months. Uh, it's taken me quite a few months to sort of like really be comfortable that I really know it quite well. Um, so this is my video, my thoughts on this synthesizer after six months of use. Uh, I think it's really quite difficult to talk about the Moog One without reeling off a whole load of numbers and figures. You know, you've got your 16 voices of polyphony, your three VCOs, your two filters, your four LFOs. There are four envelope generators as well. One of them is a little bit hard to find. Um, I mean, even when you look at this beautiful front panel of the synthesizer, 73 knobs, I think it is, and 144 buttons. It's a statistician's dream, this synthesizer really is. Oh yeah, and then there's the price. The launch price here in the UK was just around £8,000. Uh, it's an accountant's dream too, I have to say. So there's one statistic that I haven't given you, and that is the fact that this is a three synth engine synthesizer. If you're not aware of that already, there are three completely separate synthesizers in here that each of them utilize all the knobs and controls that you've got on the front panel, even including the arpeggiator and the sequencer. Each synth engine has its own. Um, and, and that really makes the Moog One a huge behemoth of a synthesizer. Uh, you know, if you try and think of what the competition is for this synth, I don't think there is any competition for this synth. No other synth manufacturer has developed and built something for sale today that does what this thing is capable of doing, and, and that's pretty much a fact. I mean, if, if I try and illustrate what it means to have these three synth engines all in one box, uh, in, in a quite a crude way, I'll take the uh, example of a Prophet 6. Now that's a monotimbral synthesizer as opposed to a multi-timbral, tri-timbral synthesizer like the Moog One. So to recreate the Moog One from a Prophet 6, you'd need to take a Prophet 6 keyboard and then you'd need to take a Prophet 6 module. Well, in fact, you'd need to take two Prophet 6 modules and you'd need to somehow sort of merge them together into one synth box. And if you did that, then that, in, in kind of crude terms, is what the Moog One is. It's literally three Prophet Sixes. It's not uh, an exact comparison, of course. It's not um, this synth has got lots of things that the Prophet Six doesn't have. It's got more LFOs, more envelope generators, and, and, and all the rest of it. But uh, in crude terms, that's really what you're getting when you get a Moog One. You're getting three synthesizers in one. So this video is not going to be a review of this synthesizer in, in the traditional sense. I know I say that with every one of my, my videos, uh, but it's really true of the Moog One. Uh, there's so much here to go through. Um, I would have to gloss over it uh, to fit it all into one video. There's so much that this synthesizer is capable of that it really would require a whole series of videos um, to do it justice. So in this video, I'm, I'm going to try and hopefully uh, give you uh, my impression of the synthesizer um, and, and sort of like try and convey that with the sort of like the things that I talk about and the facilities that I pick out and, and choose to demonstrate to you. If there's one thing that blows my mind just using the Moog One, even after these many months that I've had it, is the attention to detail that's inside this synthesizer. Um, it really is mind-blowing. Um, and I'm going to try and get that across to you in this video, sort of like time and time again, try and get across uh, the attention to detail 
uh, that they've put into the synthesizer. And we'll start with something really basic and simple, a humble LFO. Let's just take a look at one of these four LFOs and I'll try and show you what I mean by this attention to detail that's in the synthesizer. Okay, so here we have our four LFOs down the left-hand side of the synth. Uh, they're all identical. Um, we've got a control to change the rate of the LFO. And we've got a button here, a red button, with some indicators showing us the different waveforms. So we've got triangle wave, square, sawtooth, and a pseudo-random sample and hold uh, waveform there as well. This uh, destination button here is part of the mod matrix capability. It's so that you can just say, okay, I want this LFO uh, to modulate something, and then you go and find the destination. And I'll cover that when we look at the mod matrix. Um, but the other button that all of these sections, pretty much all of these sections have, is this little um, triangular shaped button top right. Um, and by pressing it, it takes us to the menu. Um, and that's where we'll find a lot more detail for these LFOs than what you get on the front panel. So this is the screen that we get, the display that we get for LFO number four, uh, the LFO I selected earlier. We get at the top here, we've got a graphic showing us what the waveform looks like. Um, and we can see the values that we've selected on the front panel. Now below it, and this works the same way for everything on the Moog One, we have a menu system. And that menu system consists of rows of up to four values. And we use these soft knobs here to change values. And we can change the rows with this big rotary encoder here. So uh, this is where the sort of the, the attention to detail starts to, sh to show itself. Uh, we've got a range control here where we can go from slow to low to medium to high, and it affects the sort of the values and frequencies that you can choose with the rate control on the front panel. So we can go all the way down to 0 0.001 of a hertz. Um, and then if I go up to high and turn the control again, we've gone up to 1000 hertz. So we've got this massive great range uh, on our LFOs in terms of the rate. Um, we've got a variation uh, control. Uh, now, here we have a triangle wave that we've selected. You might have noticed there was no sine wave on the front panel for us to select. But using this variation control, we can smooth out the waveform and we can choose sine wave or anywhere in between that we want to. Uh, and that works differently depending on the waveform that I've selected on the front panel. We've got the ability to have a bipolar waveform or unipolar whether it goes up above and below zero or it's all above zero. We can specify the start phase of the LFO. Uh, the next row, we've got sync options for syncing it to MIDI and the internal clock of the synthesizer. On the next row, we've not only got a delay time so that we can delay after triggering the LFO when it kicks in, but we've also got a fade in time to specify how slowly, how smoothly uh, the LFO starts to fade in. Beautiful for tremolo and uh, vibrato effects. And we've also got a fade out time as well, so we can fade the LFO back out again. And we've got that because we can specify how many repeats the LFO will perform, either infinite, which is normal for an LFO, or we could specify anything from just one repeat all the way up to 32 repeats. So you've got a massive amount of control over this LFO. It's really, really a huge amount of detail here. And then on the last row, we've just got one uh, parameter that we can set here, and it's called smoothing. And it doesn't uh, change the display, the graphic, um, but what it does do is it implements a glide, a portamento effect from one value to the next. And the best way that I can demonstrate that to you is if I choose the sample and hold waveform. So just random step values. Um, now what I've got, I've got this modulating the cutoff of the ladder filter. And I'm playing through the ladder filter purely noise, nothing more, no oscillators, just noise. So if I hold down a key, this is what it sounds like. So you can hear that the, the cutoff is being set to random values, but they're hard stepped. So if I turn up this smoothing control, we can have much more room. 
materialistic wind effect. Okay, let's briefly look at the oscillators. To be very honest with you, I don't really have anything to say about them. I mean, you know, they seem to be pretty standard to me. Uh, they do their job. Uh, do they sound amazing or special? I'm gonna leave that entirely up to you to be the judge. Uh, we all have our own opinions on what sounds good and what doesn't. Um, you know, just quickly covering what facilities we have here. We're just looking at oscillator number three. There are obviously three of them, and that's the big, you know, that's the, that's the big plus point of the Moog One, it has three uh, oscillators, whereas most uh, polysynths, analog polysynths generally just have two. Um, so we have that third one. Uh, we have a choice of two waveforms per oscillator. On the right hand side, we have a square wave, and on the left hand side, we have a choice of waveform. Uh, at the moment, we have just here showing the display, the square wave, and of course, as you'd expect, we have the ability to change the pulse width and modulate that. Um, and then we have a mix control to blend in the other waveform on the left hand side here. Um, so you can create a wide variety of waveforms with this blend control. Now in terms of the waveform on the left hand side, we have a choice. We've got this red button here. We have a choice of triangle and sawtooth. If we go back to triangle, uh, we've got a wave angle um, control here, which allows us to morph that triangle, uh, that, sorry, that yeah, that triangle quite a lot. So we can morph it all the way over to the right and create a reverse sawtooth. And we can morph it all the way over to the left and create a regular sawtooth. And I just find it a little bit weird that we can create a sawtooth here, but then we've also got the ability to play a sawtooth as well. Now, uh, I believe that this sawtooth, this sort of, uh, is, a, is a special sawtooth. Uh, this wave angle still works. Uh, you'll see here best on the on the screen what's going on. It's very, very slightly changing the initial sort of attack of that waveform. Uh, and, and I believe this is so that you can recreate all sorts of wonderful vintage sawtooths from, from synthesizers in years gone by. Uh, I think that's the idea behind it. Um, I'm not really an expert on that, but anyway, if you're a, a sawtooth, uh, connoisseur then I'm sure you'll have lots of fun with this particular wave angle control and the sawtooth on the oscillator. Okay, let's have a little look at the filter section on the Moog One. I really do like it. It's very, very flexible um, and it sounds absolutely lovely. It really does. Uh, there's so many modulation uh, you know, capabilities with this filter section. Uh, I think they've done a really, really good job. So we've got basically two filters here. We've got a state variable filter on the left and we have a standard Moog ladder filter on the right. And we have a mix control so we can blend between the two. And obviously you can modulate that. Now the, the right hand side ladder filter, uh, we have a number of options on the slope of it, 24, 18, 12 and 60 B. So that's four pole, three pole, two pole, one pole. It's a self resonating filter as you'd expect from Moog and it sounds absolutely lovely. You've got high pass and low pass options on it. In terms of the state variable filter, um, you can't sweep between its different modes. You have to go through this little mode button here, but you can switch between notch, band pass, high pass, and low pass, as you'd expect. Um, it's not a self-resonating filter at all, but it does sound really, really nice. It really does sound lovely. Um, you can operate it in parallel and serial. We'll get onto that in a minute. Um, and you can link the cutoffs 
of both of these filters so that one single filter sweep will affect them both if you want to and that's absolutely fine um, the state variable filter itself has actually got two identical filter circuits inside it uh, so it's actually three filter circuits in total per voice on this synthesizer um, and although those two circuits in the state variable filter are synchronized you can spread out uh, their cutoff frequencies or space out the cutoff frequencies if you're familiar with the Moog matriarch then it works in a very very similar way uh, and if we look here on the display I can turn this and I can separate out the cutoff frequencies of the two circuits and then when I move the main cutoff knob they both move together like that so you can get some really wonderful modulations going on with uh, with these filters because this is modulatable and obviously the cutoffs are modulatable as well um, so probably the best way for me to demonstrate that is just to play you just a, a couple of patches where I've got some filter modulation going on um, so you can hear the kind of thing that you can do. Okay, so the last thing I really want to talk about with the filter section is the audio signal routing capabilities. It's very flexible, uh, but it can be a little bit tricky to get your head around. Um, you can operate these two filters in parallel or in serial, and you can also operate the two uh, filter circuits inside the state variable filter in parallel or in serial. So what I've done is just put together a little graphic to help try and explain how this works. Um, uh, rather than me just uh, fumbling around with knobs and buttons and trying to explain it. Okay, so here's the first graphic showing the filters in parallel. We've basically got an audio signal coming out of our VCA. It can pass into each of our filters separately, and then the output from those filters is then summed in some way and passed on downstream to the VCA. So we can control how the audio is applied to the filters out of our VCOs with the little on-off buttons that are in the mixer section on the front panel. Uh, we can turn them on and off individually to determine do we send audio to the state variable filter, or do we send it to the ladder filter, and do we send it to both. And we've also got a nice little mix control on the filter section that allows us to effectively mix the outputs from those two filters before passing that audio signal downstream. So it's quite simple, the filters in parallel, Let's now look at the filters in series. So the main difference here is that the audio signal coming out of the state variable filter then passes into the ladder filter and then out from the ladder filter downstream to the VCA. Uh, so we've still got control over which filters receive audio. Um, and so we still use our little on off buttons in our mixer section to do that. Not a problem at all. But then I thought to myself, well, where do I add the mix control, how does the mix control work in this series configuration? And it started to get rather complicated. I've been scratching my head quite a lot. I realize I'm totally out of my depth. I just don't know how the mix control works. I had a go at modifying the diagram, uh, but I really don't know what I'm doing at this point. So I think it's time to cue some rather distracting music. <laughs>
Okay, let's have a look at the modulation capabilities of the Moog One. I'm not gonna go into massive detail because there's an awful lot to cover with modulation. It really can do modulation in an incredibly detailed and flexible way. But there are basically two ways of setting up a modulation uh, with the Moog One. One is to use the mod matrix, and I'll show you that in a second. And the second way is to use the sort of like the quick access hardwired modulation capabilities that the synth has. Um, and they're on the front panel here. So here we're looking at the, the three VCOs, um, and this section below it is all modulation of those oscillators. We've got pitch modulation, ring mod, waveform modulation, and frequency modulation. Um, and these are hardwired, as I said before. So pitch modulation is hardwired to using LFO number one or the modulation envelope generator. Waveform modulation is hardwired to using LFO number three. Uh, so, you know, you have to sort of take that into consideration. It's quick access to do things very, very quickly, uh, but you are constrained as to what those modulation sources are going to be. Likewise, on the filter section, we also have some more quick access modulations. Okay, let's have a look at the mod matrix now. Uh, it's accessible through this little button here on the front panel called mod. And on the face of it, it seems to be very similar to, you know, the, the standard kind of mod matrix that you'd find on any sophisticated synthesizer. Um, you know, we've got rows here on the screen, one row for each modulation that you've set up. Um, and we have got um, source, uh, destination, uh, we've got an optional controller, so that could be you know the mod wheel, pitch bend wheel, aftertouch, etc. And we've also got a transform option, and I'll talk about that in a little while because that's something that's that's quite interesting and different. Okay, let's take a look at a couple of the more complex and advanced features of the mod matrix now. Um, the first thing we're gonna have a look at is variables, VARs as it's called. Um, now these, I think the best way to think about a variable, um, if you're not into computer programming, which most people aren't, uh, think about like a pocket calculator. You do a calculation and you save the result in the memory of the calculator so that you can retrieve it later uh, and use that number to do some other calculation. That memory is a little storage area where you save a value. And that's what variables are. That's how we use them in computer programming, for example. And what um, the mod matrix does uh, in the Moog One is allow you to set up a modulation uh, and rather than modulate something straight away, it allows you to save that modulation in a variable, in a var, which you can then use later on in another modulation. Now I was trying to think of a best way to sort of like show you this in action. Uh, and what I've got here is I've got an initialized patch set up and I've turned the filter cutoff right down. So we've got quite a nice muted sound, okay? So what I want to do is I want to um, modulate that filter cutoff with an LFO. Um, but I want the amount of modulation that occurs to be controllable by aftertouch. So the way that we do that is specify our source in the modulation matrix as being our LFO, specify our destination as being filter cutoff for our ladder filter, which is what we're using here, and then specify our controller is aftertouch. There it is. So the values here are initially 100%. So if I hold down a chord and then press down on it, it's a bit drastic, isn't it? 
Uh, so let's dial those numbers back a bit. So that's all fine. We haven't had to use any variables to set that up. It's very, very straightforward. We've got a source, we've got a destination, and we've added a controller. But what if we want to have some dynamic control over the amount of that modulation, not only with aftertouch, but with the mod wheel as well? so that we can sort of like in real time vary how much that effect is. Now we can do that with variables or with vars. So rather than in this uh, particular modulation, us modulating the cutoff directly, what we can do is save this modulation to a variable. We get this var section at the end and we've got variables. Uh, we've got nine or 10, is it? We've got 10 variables at our disposal. So let's use variable slot number one. It's like a memory slot number one on a calculator. So once we've done that, um, we don't actually have any modulation going on at all because we haven't specified the destination of our filter cutoff yet. Now what we can do in our next row of our matrix is choose that variable as our source. It's in here somewhere towards the end, presumably. There we go, the variables are towards the end. So we're gonna choose variable number one as our source. And if we were to just specify the destination of our filter cutoff, like that, we've got two modulation rows equivalent to that first one that I set up. But the whole purpose of doing this is that we can now add another controller to this modulation. We can now add a mod wheel in as our controller, like that. Now we've got full control over the amount of that modulation, not just with aftertouch, but with the mod wheel as well. Right, the last thing I want to show you with the mod matrix is another advanced feature. It's called transform. And now I can't think of another synth that I've used that has this capability. It's quite an advanced feature. Uh, but what is a transform? It's a way of affecting in some way the modulation signal that's coming from a source before it gets applied to your destination that you've chosen. It's a way of manipulating that signal in some way. Now I've played around with this a little bit uh, I know some of the transforms, uh, but not all of them at all. So I will show you what I know, uh, which hopefully won't take too long. But it'll hopefully give you an idea of how these transforms work and how you might want to use them. So here we've got a very simple modulation. LFO number one, 50% modulating ladder filter cutoff. And it sounds like this, as you'd expect. Okay, uh, what we'll do is we'll set a transform on that signal. Um, the first couple that we've got here are limit low and limit high. This is what limit low does. It's effectively limiting what the lowest value of the signal, modulation signal, can be. So we start off at zero, so no effect. And as I turn it up, you 
here that constant tone is the low limit that we're setting and increasing. And similarly, we've got limit high. Um, but actually, 100% is it not doing anything. And then if we bring it down. You get that kind of effect. Uh, let's take a look at some other ones. Well, squared is basically taking that signal and multiplying it by itself. And cubed is taking the signal and multiplying it by itself two times. So taking a very small signal and turning it into a much bigger signal. Um, it's not going to work well with LFO, uh, but you get the idea. We've got other things called low pass and high pass. Uh, I need to look at what those do. Um, I presume they're a little bit like limiting. I don't know. Uh, slew, this is an interesting one. So if I change the LFO waveform to be sample and hold, uh, it sounds like this. And then what we can do with slew is rather than have those hard changes in value, we can add a little bit of portamento glide to it. And as well as slewing up and down, we can choose just to slew the notes that are going up or the changes in value that are going up and leave the ones coming down alone. Or the other way around, slew down. And then we've got other things that I haven't, honestly, I haven't played with bounce, sample and hold. And uh, we've got this thing called function and function goes into a whole load of mathematical functions here. Uh, some of them look really quite complex. We've got signs, for example, uh, triangle, generate a triangle out of the, the source and the control. Saw, it's, it's a lot of really quite advanced certainly advanced things and we've got one here called quantize um, so we can actually create quantized values out of an lfo for example Right, so this is the part of the video where I, I choose to talk about a few negatives. Um, so we'll get through this as quickly as we can and then get back to some positives. Uh, but there are some negatives, unfortunately, with the synthesizer. Um, now, I remember really very well when I first got it, unboxed it, set it up, plugged it in and played it. Well, my first reaction was uh, I was slightly intimidated by it. I mean, it is a really, it's a large and, and uh, 
uh, in your face uh, synthesizer the, the the panel on it it looks so impressive it's a really beautiful looking impressive looking big synthesizer uh, i was really in awe of it i have to say um, but my expectations were high when it came to the sound and if, if there's one thing that i actually was a little bit disappointed by or nonplussed by uh, that was actually the sound of it i went through all of the the presets uh, that it comes with the factory presets uh, and played them all um, and it just they, they sounded like there was something missing um, and i've had that feeling a couple of times uh, in, in my history with synthesizers uh, when i have a synthesizer i plug it into my mixer for the very first time uh, it's got a stereo output but i forget to pan the two channels fully left and right uh, and when you play the synthesizer it sounds like there's something a bit missing and, and that's the kind of feeling i got with the moog one i double checked made sure everything was working as it as it should be it still sounded a little bit lackluster i put my best uh, headphones into it and played it through headphones and i still kind of got that feeling like there's something missing uh, and i couldn't quite put my finger on it um, i was just a little bit disappointed by the sound now before I got the Moog One, my go-to analog polysynths are these two here. I've got an OB6 uh, module edition and a Prophet 6 module edition. Hopefully you can see them behind me. Um, and I use those day in, day out, and I absolutely love them to pieces. Yes, they're not the most comprehensive synthesizers. They haven't got the biggest polyphony going, uh, but the sound from them is really, really beautiful. Um, and comparing the sound of those synthesizers to the sound of the Moog One, I was struggling to actually really like and gel with the sound of the Moog One. And it took me quite a long time of experimentation and fiddling around uh, to figure out what the problem actually was. Um, and it comes down to stereo. Um, now I know you know if you're if you're if you're writing music and playing music, you're part of a band, or you're putting together your own songs. Uh, there's going to be lots of instruments involved. Uh, you really sort of like use stereo uh, sounds from synthesizers very very sparingly because how the hell do you mix them uh, if you've got a whole bunch of stereo sounds coming from your synths? Uh, so I know from that point of view, the stereo uh, outputs from synthesizers isn't the most important. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, all our, our uh, synths, whether they're digital, hybrid or analog, that have got inbuilt effects uh, are really sort of like pushing to give you really impressive sounding presets um, and impressive sounding stereo width to the sounds, uh, because that's what's going to really make you interested in buying the synthesizer in the first place. Uh, and it just seemed to me rather weird that uh, it was not something that was really well thought about um, in the, in the Moog One, in the presets that I was listening to, and in the presets that I put together uh, that were sort of like copying what I had done on the OB6 and the Prophet 6. So it turns out, uh, in my opinion, that uh, Moog One doesn't do stereo very well. It seems to be almost a bit of an afterthought. Um, and I'm gonna try and explain in a little bit of detail what I mean about that. So the way that stereo is implemented in both the Prophet 6 and the OB6 is in two ways. First of all, there are two master effects that you can choose um, at the top here, and, and they are stereo effects like reverbs and delays and choruses and that kind of thing. And then the second way that you can implement stereo with these synths is through this very simple control here on the front panel called pan spread. Um, and as you turn it up, uh, you'll hear that the voicings are sort of like pseudo randomly start to sort of like spread left and right in the channel all the way up to a maximum. Um, now I've recorded just a little test of how that sounds on the OB6 so you can just, uh, just understand what I'm talking about here with the pan spread control. So that's the pan spread on the OB6. Now the way that the Moog One implements stereo is the same way as those synthesizers. First of all, you have stereo effects that you can implement. Uh, you know, the normal reverbs, delays, choruses, etc. 
Um, but as well as that, there is also a pan spread control. But it's not a dedicated control easily accessible on, on the front panel. It's actually in a menu and it's, it's buried quite deep in a menu and I'll show you that now. You have to go to the VCA section, which is the two little controls way over here uh, on the, the edge of the synth. You've got two controls there. One is a level control and the other one is a pan control. Um, but you don't have access to pan spread here on the front panel. You press the little button uh, on the top right of the VCA section. That takes you to a menu. You then have to go three levels down in that menu to find the pan spread controls. And it's, it's because they're so hidden down there that I kind of get the impression that they are a bit of an afterthought. Um, so you've got a pan spread control. Um, and it should work very similarly to the Dave Smith synthesizers. Here's a little test that I did uh, of that pan spread control in action on the Moog one. So that's the pan spread in action on the Moog One. It is very predictable, but there's a problem with this pan spread algorithm, and that is when you're allowed to use it. Uh, and this might sound strange, it certainly sounds strange to me, but um, it depends on what effects you have got on your synth engine. So if you choose a delay effect, any delay effect, whether it's a mono effect or a stereo effect, the pan spread algorithm works. But if you choose any other effect other than delay, pan spread is completely disabled. And I have absolutely no understanding of why that might be, what the decisions are behind that. Uh, is it a bug? I don't know. Hopefully it's a bug. But if it is a bug, it's been there for the last 18 months um, and it hasn't been addressed or fixed. It seems to be very, very strange that you know, you can't spread the voicing um, when you have bit crush effect selected uh, or, or any mono effect selected other than delay. It just doesn't seem to make any sense to me and it's a big limitation.
Okay, so I don't want to go and just go through all the sort of the bugs that I know about um, and have discovered and things like that because I think that would be unfair. Uh, there are bugs. There are plenty of bugs still outstanding with the synthesizer. I'm going to talk about them in, in kind of general terms uh, when I get to a conclusion in this video, but um, there's only one bug that I really want to talk about uh, in this sort of being negative section of the video, um, and that is tuning. Um, now, I've been lucky, I think. My, my Moog One, uh, I don't have tuning issues with it. Um, there are, remember, 48 oscillators inside this synthesizer, three per voice and you've got 16 voices. So that's a lot of oscillator circuits inside here. Um, and they're going to, you know, they're voltage control oscillators, they're going to drift out of tune. Um, it's just a fact of life. Um, now, I've had my synth for about six months. Um, I don't know when it was manufactured. I didn't buy it brand new. Let's say it's a year old. Um, hopefully when it left the factory, everything was, was calibrated perfectly and it was really, really in tune. Now, after 12 months, let's say, um, it's, it's nicely out of tune. It's just very, very slightly out of tune. I'm gonna play you now a little test I, I recorded earlier. I've got two oscillators playing, just holding down one note so you can hear the very, very slight variations that you hear from one note to the next. So I really like that. I really like um, the sort of, the, just the tiny amount out of tune that the synth is. You know, it sounds like a vintage synth that you'd spent a very, very long time trying to tune. It's just got that little bit of sort of unpredictability about it and I like it. Um, but I know that I'm, you know, one of the, one of the privileged to have a synth that sounds like this. And there are people out there who have got some serious tuning issues with their Moog ones. Either they had them, uh, those issues from the very beginning or those issues started to occur after they did a firmware update. Um, there are various sort of like accounts by people on social media of the tuning issues that they have had in the past or are still having now. All the synthesizers that I own um, that are polysynths and analog have a a calibration routine, uh, a, you know, a retuning algorithm that they, they run. Uh, my little mini log Korg mini log XD. Every time you switch it on, it goes through a tuning uh, sort of pr procedure, uh, and you can rerun that pr tuning procedure anytime you want to with it. The Prophet Six and the OB Six, uh, you just hold down two buttons anytime you want to, and it will recalibrate the oscillators and the filters. Um, and you know it takes a minute or so to do it, um, but it's there now. When the Moog One was was released, there was no. Uh, calibration routine. There was no ability to tune it. You had to ship it off back to Moog, uh, who would then presumably open it up and use a screwdriver or whatever they do and go around to all 48 of those oscillators uh, and recalibrate them for you. Just a completely impractical thing. Um, so there was, you know, clearly something that hadn't been thought about properly was a, a recalibration routine for the Moog One. And it's taken them, you know, almost 18 months to come up with their solution to the tuning problems in the synth, um, which is a, a real-time um, compensation algorithm, they call it, oscillator compensation. So what you do is you run an incredibly lengthy, it takes a very long time, very tortuous uh, routine where the synthesizer will pick every single oscillator in turn, all 48 of them on a 16 voice synth, and it'll go from the highest possible frequency all the way down to the lowest possible frequency on every single oscillator. It'll do this for all of them. And I guess what it's doing is it's measuring the expected frequency versus the actual sound frequency that's generated by the oscillator. So it's building basically a big table, a big map of uh, how out of tune each of your oscillators is or for any given frequency that you might ask it to play. Then what's happening is uh, when you play in real time 
as you hold down a note, as you expect your oscillators to play a note, uh, that might be the note you're playing, or it might be that you've got some sort of modulation going on, or pitch bend, or whatever it is, at that precise moment, it'll say, ah, you want to play 440 hertz, so your chosen oscillator number 27, uh, and this is how I must get that oscillator to generate 440 hertz. Uh, it's a, a complex and clever algorithm that's going on, um, but I don't like it. Uh, and I'm going to try and show you why I don't like it. Uh, and there's two reasons. First of all, it creates such a precise sound that it lacks any soul, any feeling. I just don't like it. Um, I might as well be playing a fully digital synthesizer to get those kind of sounds. But also, there are some weird things going on with this algorithm. Uh, weird things that I just don't think should be there. So there are two issues there with the sound that it makes, apart from the fact that it is totally sterile and so in tune that it doesn't sound really very inspiring compared to the un, you know, uncompensated version, which I much, much prefer. Um, but then you've got it when you hold down a, a long note, you get this weird warbling going on, like a sort of buzzing insect. It's just very, very odd, very, very weird. Now obviously when you're building a patch and you're, and you're playing lots of notes and you're, you've got the filtration going on, you're modulating stuff and all that kind of stuff, all that stuff will sort of hide this sort of warbling effect um, and it'll make it much, much less obvious. But the pure sound is warbling. It's warb I don't know how to describe it. It's just awful. It's an awful sound. And you know, this is Moog. This is a Moog synth where we all just like to listen to the raw sound of the oscillators and go, hmm, that's a nice sawtooth. You know, here is a horrible warbling sound. Uh, you don't hear it so much in the higher registers, but in that sort of like lower midsection, it's very, very noticeable. And I just don't understand why they released this compensation algorithm without really, you know, understanding fully the, the, the implications of doing so. The thing is, you know, my choice is either as it is, which is nicely out of tune at the moment, or compensation on totally sterile with a bit of a warble. I've got nothing in between. Um, there's no dial that will allow me to sort of like have it just a little bit out of tune. It's all or nothing with this algorithm. And I think that that is a mistake uh, because you can't dial it back. It's sterile, warbling or out of tune. Okay, so here is an example of the kind of patches that I end up creating on the Moog one, and I, I do this a lot. This one, it's utilizing all three synth engines, um, but I end up playing them in a, in a kind of sort of live jam kind of way, which is really quite unusual for me, I have to say. Um, but I'll show you what I mean. So let's just uh, start off by auditioning each of the synth engines in turn so you can hear what they sound like. So I'm just gonna isolate synth engine uh, number one. Hopefully you can see here on the screen 
Uh, it's the top line, it's called pluck, um, and according to the red, it's only active from the middle of the keyboard upwards, so it's a split, uh, and it sounds like this. And I program the mod wheel so it actually lengthens the decay of the filter envelope. So if I turn the camera around so you can see the mod wheel. Uh, and the effect is this. So that is synth engine number one. Uh, so let's just turn it off for the time being, go to synth engine number two. So this one is all across the whole keyboard. It's a very simple little pad and it sounds like this. So there's no sustain, it's just a gentle attack and a gentle decay away. Let me just show you the amp envelope. So it's a linear attack and an exponential decay. But again, I programmed the mod wheel and this time I am going to be uh, increasing the sustain of this particular envelope. So again, if I turn this camera around so you can see the mod wheel. This is the effect it has. So that is synth engine number two. And let's just go to synth engine number three. Well, synth engine number three uh, is not uh, on keyboard control. It's not on local control. Um, and the way I am playing it is just by playing an, uh, a sequence. So uh, I've got the sequencer armed here and it just sounds like this. Nice little twinkly sound. And I'll introduce that at some point as I'm playing the other two synth engines. So uh, let's go ahead and just do this little demo so you can hear um, the kind of thing I end up doing. I'm going to start off just with synth uh, engine number one and I'll introduce synth engine number two uh, a little bit later. synth number two. Let's increase the mod wheel. some bass notes. that synth engine number three. Let's 
to land it. Got a sequence for synth engine number one as well. Okay, so I have just finished doing some editing of this video so far on my PC and I've seen how long this video has become. It's over an hour now, I'm really sorry for that. Uh, it's just, there's so much to talk about with the synthesizer um, and I really haven't gone into very much detail at all as you can see from this video so far. Um, so I think it's time that I gave you my conclusions and we wrapped up this video. Um, the the pan spread uh, issue that I mentioned earlier in the video um, it took me by surprise the sort of like the difficulty and the quirks with the synthesizer getting you know at the kind of stereo sounds that I'm used to uh, it took me a while to get around that but after you know plenty of experimentation a lot of practice I'm, I'm happy with the sounds I'm getting from. Uh, the Moog one now. All of the patches that I've been playing uh, to you in this video, they're all stereo, they're all using you know good full stereo width um, and I'm happy with the sounds. Um, it, it's just the quirks, the quirks that are there and some limitations I don't think should be there um, but I've kind of got around them and I also I, I've stopped comparing the Moog one to my Dave Smith uh, synthesizers. That's the kind of mindset that I was stuck in for quite a few months, comparing the two synths and the sounds and how they, how, how you know, how you go about creating patches. Uh, you know, there are completely different paradigms in the Dave Smith uh, OB6 and Prophet 6 compared to the Moog one. Um, you know, completely opposite ends of a spectrum. With the Dave Smith uh, synthesizers, you've got simplicity as much simplicity as he could get away with but still you've got a beautiful sounding instrument and with the Moog One you've got complexity uh, you've got a huge amount of complexity and they keep on adding more and more complexity in there with every firmware update um, they're creating the synthesizer that you know you'll ultimately be able to create any sound possible with it um, it's it's really a totally different paradigm to a Dave Smith Instruments synthesizer, uh, but still you've got a beautiful sound. So it doesn't replace my Dave Smith uh, synthesizers. It kind of complements them at the end of the day. Do I need them all? No, of course I don't need them all. Uh, do I need a Moog One? No, I don't need a Moog One, but I really absolutely love it. I have grown to love this synthesizer, and not just because it's so expensive, uh, because it's so capable. It's got so much capability in it, and it sounds beautiful uh, when, you know, you figure out how to get the best from it. You know, I, I, I don't want to talk about 
money. Uh, I don't want to talk about the price. I don't want to say, is it worth it, yes or no, because everyone is different. You know, most people can't afford the synthesizer. Uh, I'm surprised that Moog haven't come out with uh, a poly synth that's lower spec than the Moog one. You know, as I said before, the Moog one is three synth engines in one. Uh, why haven't they come out with a smaller version of it in a sort of a subsequent 37 kind of form factor, um, which is just you know, a monotimbral version of the same sound engine that you have here with maybe, you know, eight voice polyphony or even six voice polyphony. Why haven't they done that? Uh, you know, they've done all the research and development, all the R&D and a massive amount of it to create this beautiful synthesizer. They could easily come up with a smaller cut down version, a more affordable cut down version. Uh, that would find, you know, so many Moog fans out there would, would just want, want to buy it. Maybe it would be, I don't know, a, you know, $2,000 synthesizer like the Matriarch, for example. Um, they would sell them. They would sell them by the ton. Uh, I don't know why they haven't done that. Uh, this is an incredibly expensive synthesizer. And um, when it first came out and it was first announced, I was very interested in it but I always knew from the beginning I would never have one because I could never afford one. And even if I did happen to have, you know, seven or eight thousand pounds lying around in a bank account, which I don't ever have, uh, I would never be able to justify blowing it all on a single instrument. It would just be outrageous for me to do so. Um, now, I've ended up getting one. And the reason I've got one is because it came up on eBay uh, about six months ago, so before the whole COVID-19 thing kicked off, um, and someone wanted to sell theirs very, very quickly, and it was such a good price, and the price of it was pounds. It's a massively expensive synthesizer. It really is. I never thought I'd have one. Um, and part of my problem with this synthesizer for many months after I got it was even though I got it for a really cut down price, it was a bit of a bargain, I still in my mind could not justify it. Uh, and so I was, I was constantly thinking, what can I do on this that I can't do on anything else or with anything else combined? Why do I need this? It's too much money. It was, it was too much money for me, um, and it's taken me a long time to, to accept <laughs> that, I've, that I've spent all this money on this synthesizer. Uh, it's a lot of money. Um, so do I need it? No. You could definitely uh, get very, very close, or even you know, exceed what it can do sonically with a bunch of um, you know, VST plugins uh, or a bunch of different pieces of equipment and a good uh, MIDI controller keyboard. And honestly, um, you really can. You don't need the synthesizer. If you're sitting there uh, feeling a bit glum because it's a beautiful synth and you can't afford it, then trust me, you don't actually need it. Um, it's, it's really, uh, it's not necessary. It's a luxury item. <laughs> it's like a sports car. It really is like a sports car, and it's a terrible analogy. It really is a terrible analogy, but it is a sports car. Uh, and you know what? There's so much there in it that I don't actually use. I actually find myself creating patches and overcomplicating them uh, just because I can, because it does have four LFOs. It has four envelopes. Uh, it has incredible uh, modulation capabilities. Uh, where a simple patch would do, I create a complicated patch. Um, so I'm still, you know, mentally, subconsciously trying to justify playing it and using it. I've got to use all its capabilities, otherwise, what's the point? Okay, that's enough. Uh, I stopped falling over it. Um, I absolutely love this synthesizer, I have to say, I really do. Uh, I feel very, very privileged to be able to have it here and play it. Um, very, very priv privileged. I don't know whether I'll be able to keep it, but forever, who knows what will happen. But at the end of the day, I'm going to play it while I've got it. It's lovely. Uh, that's it. That's all I can say about this synthesizer. Um, I am, I'm drooling. Uh, it is, is great. That's all. 
Thank you very, very much for all your patience uh, watching this video. If you've got to the end right now, it's been a very long haul. Uh, I really do appreciate you watching my videos. Uh, comments, leave whatever comments you like uh, and I'll, questions and I'll try and answer them if I can. Uh, I would really appreciate if you subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you, until the next time, thanks very, very much.